Welcome everyone to another week of the show will go on business survival series webinar. Uh, I am your host Tom Simpson. Um, as always at your disposal you can find me in all of these places if you don't already know where to go. And I have a ton of content this week. Um, I don't know sometimes I don't know when to stop. Um, if you're new to this webinar this particular series you know we schedule it for an hour. I generally it takes me an hour just to get the content through, um, and then we do Q and A. So we've been running about an hour and a half, which is about all my voice can handle. So, without further ado, I want to give a shout out to Avixa, who is helping support this webinar, this series of webinars for you, trying to find ways to get um, resources out to the live events industry. Um, Infocom, um, of course, is the event supported by Avixa which unfortunately has been canceled in June, but that was the right thing to do. Um, that's where we all meet, but now we're meeting like this. We're meeting online and then small groups online. So please take advantage of that. So they've got a free basic membership. Uh, do look into that. The links are on the replay page so you can access that. Uh, they have free training available right now through June to support people in that. Um, they have a business survival exchange. Let me talk about that. And they have worked with the U.S. Travel Association to help get us represented in Congress and get us into the CARES Act and further acts. So the business survival exchange is hosted every Friday. They recap what we talk about each week in this webinar. So if you want to talk with your peers, there's a great place to do it. Um, it seems to be going very, very well. Um, from all the folks that are reporting back to me. So I think it's worth taking advantage of and you should definitely check it out. This, this webinar is being recorded. This is where it's gonna replay. So grab that QR code and you'll be ready to watch this. The webinar, this webinar right now will probably be posted about an hour after the event is over if everything goes well. And that's usually about the time I go, yeah, yeah, definitely I hit record, awesome, good. Um, let me help you. I am still free. I'm still doing 15 minute triage calls with anybody who wants them. Schedule your one time call. We'll check off your list. We'll go down all the things that you've done. Make sure you've done enough. See if there's any ideas that you haven't thought of that you need to apply going forward. Uh, we've done about 50 of these. They're, um, uh, they're very valuable for me, so they must be valuable for you. I'm learning a lot from it. We're helping a lot of folks, so do take advantage of that. And I will talk about this more later on in the program. I have started a group coaching program that I'm inviting business owners to join. You can look into it uh, through this QR code, but I'll talk about it more uh, towards the end of the webinar. All right, now I, I would like to start off with a recap. I like to talk about where we've been. Sometimes we need to check our, thing, our thinking when things are changing as fast as they are. Um, Sometimes all you know changes happen all day long, but certainly every week things are changing. I want to remind us of what we've learned and what is still true and what might have changed since then. So we started these on March 18th. That was week one, and I told everybody that this is not a drill. Um, I said don't expect any substantive revenue at least through August in the live events space. Uh, many of you were a little shocked and aghast at that, and now August sounds really reasonable. Um, so. Um, there's that. So it wasn't <laughs> my dire predictions might come true, but let's be realistic. We don't know exactly when business is going to come back. Um, so we have to figure out how to keep things going uh, with minimal revenue as long as possible. Uh, at this point, you should be down to a skeleton crew, minimal salaries, minimal outlay. Your overhead should be really, really um, down to the minimum. Your expenses should all be slashed. Um, and you should be working through your grief stages. And this is important. You have the denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Most of us kind of circle over three of those at a time. And, you know, you get up to that, you know, that bargaining phase, and then you backslide into denial, anger, bargaining, or maybe bargaining, anger, denial. This is part of the process. So work through it. We're trying to get to acceptance. We're trying to get to that point where, you do the things that you know you need to do, you get into that airplane mode, and uh, then we start planning for what our reboots are gonna look like. So week two, we talked about cash flow modeling. Put a template up there. I know many of you are using it. I am using it. I'm using it for home finances, I'm using it for business finances. 
Um, you've done some clever things to adapt it for your uses. That's fantastic. That's what it's there for. Uh, remember, your goal is to constantly try and push your expiration date, which is the date when you go permanently negative on cash, as far out to the future. Every little victory moves your timeline forward. And that's our game now is how do we keep our cash going? So work on those little orders, work on those little victories, reducing expenses, whatever it takes to move that date farther and farther out. Um, we're starting, to, I told you to make room for loans and grants and refunds and things like that. We've, we were seeing these happen as well. And the government relief forms, at least in the US, um, were coming out right about then. So week three, um, we started talking about the do-over. You know, it's becoming more and more apparent that the way we do business is not going to survive the long quarantine and the, 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 the period of time that we're going to have to prevent large uh, business meetings, gatherings, um, entertainment events, festivals. So many things that we rely on are going to be affected here for quite a, quite a while. So um, we also looked at in that webinar, you know, you've got internal, external, and customer facing tasks that you need to do. You know, cleaning up the things so you can leave everything alone and not touch it for a while, which includes applying for PPP. That's an internal task. Um, external is communicating to your employees, to your customers. Let them know what you're doing. Let them know where you're at. And then don't stop communicating. You've got to keep getting the messages out. Um, customers, you have to help them. You have to find, even when it hurts, you have to help them. Um, you know, letting them make the choice to not pay you for something that you probably shouldn't be asking for. I know it hurts. Um, do it. Remember, we're working on the other side. We want to have these customers when we come out of all of this. Giving them a fair shake now, being realistic and, and not being selfish. I know internally we're very selfish right now because we're trying to figure out how to put groceries on the table. But do the right thing for your business for the long term. Um, we're not going to get back to business as usual, but we are going to get back to business and we're going to need those customers. Now, last week, um, you know, CARES was starting to kick in. Lots of people had questions about PPP. I'm not an expert on this. Many of you are hiring attorneys and CPAs to comb through these, this act and try and figure out how it works. And here's the big news. Nobody knows how it works. Um, but everybody's taking their best guess about how to use it, how to apply it. Um, please keep in mind, um, some of you may not be in, it may not be in your best interest to bring back 90% of your employees at 75% of salary, even if there's forgiveness for that amount. So look at your situation. There's nothing wrong with taking PPP as a loan, applying the parts of it to your business that you can apply without having to repay, and then use the loan to pay back the rest of it. Right. Um, what's next? Um, we're starting last Sunday. Some people said their EIDL money has arrived. Um, they uh, SBA changed the the wording so that you get a thousand dollars per listed employee, which is problematic for those of you who are self-employed or 1099 and you don't list yourself as an employee. Um, so not everybody's getting ten thousand bucks, but there is a little money coming in and PPP loans are getting activated. Um, they're starting to get funded. Um, if you haven't applied yet, make sure that you look um, at the right period to measure your payroll because we are seasonal businesses and they give you a number of options to look at. Find the one that's most favorable for you because you're not trying to increase the size of your payroll. You're actually trying to minimize the size of it because that's the number of people you can afford to bring back. So find your weak period, your slow period, and more of that loan will be forgivable. And then here comes this week, this webinar, we're gonna talk about it's time to throw out everything you know about pricing. We're thinking about the future. How are we gonna to go to market you know, in the new normal whenever it starts to happen? And one of the things in our do-over in our company reboots is a, a very healthier, under, a much healthier understanding of how pricing works and how we should be doing pricing for our service businesses, because most of you are indeed service businesses. So um, just a reminder, use the Q&A box to do your questions. I see folks come in and thank you. Um, 
lots of lots of good stuff and comments and I'll I'll pause a couple of times during the during the webinar and go through a few of those. So I've got some recap questions from last week. Um, these were questions that were asked during the webinar. I'm, I'm only gonna do about four of them. I either couldn't answer them at the time or I didn't answer them thoroughly or maybe I've changed my answer, I don't know which. But here are some ones that I thought were interesting. The first one is in, in the progress billing model, remember we talked about different ways of doing um, billing for a job to get deposits on a job with the goal of not having to refund anything if there's a cancellation. So we talked about cancellations and we talked about billing. One of the models is the progress billing. It says, would, would we insist that subs, your subcontractors, sign off on a lien releases every month? And the short answer to that is generally no. Um, in a construction project, um, in that kind of progress billing, there is a, a, a mechanism for doing that, which most of us will never ever see. So if you do a job where the billing is cost plus and the customer reviews every bill, then yes, you're gonna to have to get subs to sign off that they have billed everything and that they have indeed been paid for that. But um, in generally, no, you're not going to have to do that, but it was an interesting question. Another question, how do you figure out what the progress billing or pay as you go number should be? And the answer is test it. Um, I ran through some examples and I realized I can't make an example for every situation, but test it. Remember, what you're trying to do is take a reasonable view of the work that is done in a project from the moment that it's confirmed. And we take so much of that front work that we do and the pre-production work that we do for granted, and nobody tracks their hours, hello, we need to track hours, that we're having a hard time seeing what progress building would look like. But you're designing things, you're creating schedules, you're doing drawings, you're doing material takeoffs, uh, rigging diagrams, working with other suppliers, there's a whole lot of work going on. And then prepping the job is work. All of these things are billable and pay as you go, and they're non-refundable because the work has been done, and that's the idea. Now, some of you want to take the easy way out and just turn these into ratios. If I've got a $10,000 project or a $100,000 project, 10% is this stage, 25% is this stage, and that's fine. That's fine. It's going to be harder to defend unless you tie those amounts to something tangible that you can measure to say this has been done. So remember, in this model, and we, uh, we'll talk more about this in pricing and costs later today, you know, the value of your rental has no value to the customer until it is delivered. So trying to make more of your bill look like labor and services is to your advantage in progress billing or pay as you go, because the equipment has no tangible value until it shows up, right? So minimizing how much of the order is rental versus how much it is, is service um, will help you in progress billing. Uh, another question here, what about retainers for our creative and consulting work we do, the design and such side of things? <clears throat> and I probably touched on this last week, but you know, the answer is you need to price a la carte. And for a lot of us, we've been giving away design just like we give away project management because it's a value added thing that gets us the job and our competitors don't charge for it. Now, you, most of you know my opinion about things that are value added and we don't charge for. It's like the car mats, the free car mats you get when you buy a new car. They're not free. You paid for them. They just made you think they were free or that they threw them in. Um, so yeah, your competitors may be throwing stuff in, but the fact that it's paid for somewhere. So we have to do a better job of presenting our value to customers so we can do this. But when it comes to things like creative design, you can package this. Who knows how many hours? You know, if we tried to measure, you know, your designers can tell you, well, I spent 13 hours this weekend thinking about this project. I can't charge your client for thinking about a project but we can package a creative design with a scope of work and limitations, you know, exclusions, so that we can put a number to it. And if the customer wants to go outside the scope, we can take them to another level. So here's an example of a creative design for a room layout and decoration using stock pieces. The important element here is stock. This is not custom design. This is a custom application of stock design elements and you're gonna give the client three looks, they're gonna pick one, 
You're going to give them three sketches using the look that they've chosen. Um, they're going to re review them, do a revision. You're going to give them a final design with a revision. And then you're going to have sub elements of design for, you know, uh, graphics or rigging or sound or video that might be related to this. And each of these can be a step in the progress. So once the event design is created, then we can move on to the sub design categories and apply each of those into those folks. Um, so package it. Uh, one more, uh, realistically, everyone won't make these changes. How do you compete in a market where the other providers stick with the previous model? Well, um, you, you're absolutely right. A lot of people are going to try and do business as usual. A lot of people are going to take their old retail pricing and they're going to slash it to try and win market share or, or grab a job. And there's not too much you can do to compete with someone who sells on price, except attract customers who don't buy on price, all right? So when everybody does what everybody else is doing, you get price erosion. And I'm gonna talk about the history of our rental pricing in a minute, and you'll see exactly what I mean. Doing what everybody else does leads to price erosion. What we need to understand is what are our costs? And if you have a good grasp and understanding of your costs, you're not gonna be tempted to get down there and play in the mud on price, price selling uh, with some competitors. You know what your value is, you know what it takes to do it. If you put the customer first, okay, you're gonna do a much better job of winning the type of business that is, has profit built into it. Um, so always do what's better for the customer, sell them the thing that's in their best interest and who can't sell somebody else's best interest. Okay, um, I've heard, you've heard me say it a million times, sell the what, not the how. When you sell on price, you have to sell the how and you have to make the how simple. You gotta make it parts and pieces and that's what you sell. When you sell the what, you're selling in the outcome. You're selling the benefit. How is about selling features. Anybody can sell features. Okay? Features are a commodity. Benefits are exclusive to what you do and that's where we need to be selling. And we'll talk more about sales next week. All right, I'm going to pause here. I'm going to grab a couple of questions. Um, so pardon me while I look away at my other screen. Um, yes, Infocom just announced that they're going to have a virtual event this year. They're looking for some feedback. So if you've got an email on that, please take the survey and help them how to understand how to make this event work for you. Um, a couple of people made that point. Um, lots of PPP updates. Um, the... Just a quick recap, when you, once the bank provides you the forms to the PPP requirements and you fill them out and provide the documentation, they've got to upload that to the SBA, okay? There's actually, you know, uh, accounting offices that have people online all night trying to upload applications to try and keep up with this, at, you know, from your banks or whatever. So if you can communicate directly with your bank and get your application in, they have the hassle of getting it uploaded to SBA, but it is a little bit tedious right now and it is happening and funding is starting to, to, to take place. So um, good on that. A uh, comment here about we work in TV film and always charge for pre-production work and it goes on the first draft to the client. Absolutely. Uh, you know, more and more of us are doing it, but we're going to have to be a little bit more specific and granular about what is included in that with a specific scope so that we don't have to over deliver or, and we don't have to defend it if there's a cancellation. Um, okay, with regards to creative consulting work, often renderings, drawings, and consulting as part of the sales process. How do you reconcile that charge when the client is just looking for a bid and you're just looking to get your foot in the door? So there is, um, particularly in creative work, sometimes in design build work, we have to do a lot of this on spec you need to be a lot more selective about what you're going to do on spec. What is in the best interest of the customer, make them pay for it because then they will own your work. If you do work on spec, the client doesn't own it. And you need to make that perfectly clear in your terms and conditions when you're doing spec work. If you're gonna create a design for them to consider so that you might win the job, you own the copyright on the design, they cannot use it. You need to make that perfectly clear, All right? 
if they want to own it, they should pay for it. And now they can have anybody else apply it. That's making it the customer's advantage. Is it counterintuitive for you? Yeah, you want them to hire you. Of course you do. Do you want to do your work for nothing and have them steal it and have somebody else do it? No. So don't do work on spec if you can avoid it. It doesn't apply to 100% of the situations out there, but I'm advising you to strongly reconsider your business model if you've been doing a lot of spec work. Uh, okay, how do you feel about asking for a 50% deposit up front after sale is complete and the customer is signed and agreed to the contract? What do customers tell you? Um, a customer should never sign a contract where the terms are not spelled out. So you shouldn't be asking for a deposit after the contract. The deposit should be defined in the agreement. So I, 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 going back and asking for it, mm, yeah, now you're kind of going back on your word, which that wasn't included. So um, if you're in that situation, that's probably worth a phone call to me, and I can help you sort out that if you have one specific case that you're dealing with. But right now, everybody's expecting a do-over. So even if you have an assigned contract for work in November, it is not too late to go back to the client and renegotiate the terms under the new paradigm, and you probably, probably should. All right. Um, all right. Let's talk about pricing, which means that we have to talk about costs. So <laughs> I've, I've started calling things post pandemic era, PPE, and before pandemic, BP, uh, or the olden times, as we like to say. So back in the good old days, you know, last month, um, this is the way things worked and post pandemic right now we're in that transition period in between BP and PPE where all bets are kind of off, but I will touch on that a little bit before I get into my recommendations on where I think pricing should be going. And this is not that different from what I've been teaching for the past 15 years. Um, but the urgency of it is, um, we need a little bit of history. So bear with me old guy, I like to talk about the past. Um, I'm gonna go back to the whole rental model. Rental is so cool. You buy something, um, somebody wants to use it, you rent it to them, they give you money, and then they give it back. And you can do it again and again and again. It's awesome. And so many of us are in the rental business because we like that model. And we wanna buy stuff so that we don't have to rent it from someone else and let them make the money. Um, well, that's great if you've got business, but if you've got a bunch of assets you're making lease payments on um, and no business, it's kind of foolish. Um, so we need to rethink a little bit of this. But back in 1970, there wasn't really a well-developed audiovisual rental industry. There were AV dealers who sold boxes, um, projector screens, uh, overhead projectors, film projectors, slide projectors. Um, sometimes the client didn't want to buy it. They just wanted to rent it. And back, so back then, the rental rate was scaled to the purchase price and it wasn't unusual to rent something for about 80% of what you bought it for. I mean, you're you, the dealer at the wholesale price. So you bought it for 80 bucks, the client would have paid 140 for it. You rent it to them for 70. Who wouldn't do that? <laughs> so that became the business. Now, as we moved forward a decade, you know, rental rates started to creep up more people started to have it. There used to be more dealers started to make the product available. People actually developed rental models and rental desks. And I realized the association business was out there. There was corporate industrial business out there. All of that stuff was going on. But the core AV rental business really didn't exist until the mid-70s, you know, with a counter that you can go rent from. Um, by 1990, we were definitely into specialized services, you know, um, um, we were, you know, there were audio companies, video companies, specifically in the AV space as opposed to the entertainment or theatrical space. And by 2000, um, we had this huge downturn followed by 9-11-2001, and this spawned a lot of innovation. So the big difference between business in 1990 and business in 2010, and then in 2010, there were no longer really any barriers to entry. All of our technology had gotten so easy to use. You didn't need a video engineer to set up a video projector or tweak a camera. 
or time a system. Most of you don't even know what I mean when I say time a system or what a frame shaker is. Video got really easy. Now lighting got more complicated and there was a lot of programming involved, um, but mostly it could all be done by people at very, very quickly, a quick learning curve to get in there and intuitively learn how to use these products. So, you know, that was great. Um, now, with those barriers to entry essentially gone, what we've seen over the past 10 years is a lot of price erosion, a lot of margin erosion. So, our, the way we do business has evolved. Um, you know, rental production pricing has always been arbitrary. There is no formula. And in and, and 1990, the formula was you took the purchase price and you divided it by 10, unless it was really expensive and then you divided it by 20, or it was really cheap and then you divided it by four. But it was all arbitrary, it was all made up, and everyone did it differently. And the only way you knew that you might be right is if somebody else had a price that was close to yours. But clients didn't have the means to shop like they do now. We, we didn't even have email at that time. Uh, we were doing business by fax, so it took a long time for the transparency to sweep across the marketplace and expose the fundamental flaw in our system, and that is all of our pricing is made up. You make up pricing, you make up pricing, and you make up pricing, and you may think you have some logic to it or you have some reasoning to it, but when you get down to it, if you ask why five times, you made it up. You're in good company. I used to do it too. Making up prices is something that we do. The concept that I want to get across to you today is the value of what we do is determined by the customer who doesn't have the resources or inclination to do it for themselves. So that tripod screen that was rented to the customer in 1970 or 1980, and it cost the dealer 80 bucks to buy, and they could rent it for 70 bucks a week, okay, that customer didn't want to own it. They didn't want to lug it around. They didn't want to store it. Okay. When we started doing events and shows, it's the same thing. The customer is going, well, I could buy all this equipment, and we're going to do this meeting five times a year, but now I've got to find a place to store it. What if it breaks down? Ooh, do I actually know how to set it up? Okay. This is the business that we're in. We're in a business of convenience. We're reducing our customers' need to spend capital on equipment they don't need all the time. We can use it all the time. We have more use for it. So hence, we have this rental production model that we follow. Now, let's talk about rental production math. In the post-pandemic era, or sorry, in the actually, this should say BP, before pandemic, we did revenue minus outside direct costs equals gross profit. This is pretty much everyone's formula. I've looked, I've got hundreds of P&Ls in my system that I've looked at. And most of you looked at it this way. Over the past few years, at my urging, more and more of you are looking at inside direct costs as part of your cost of goods sold formula. But most of us is, if I own the equipment and I got staff people to run it, the job has no cost to it. It's 100% gross profit or very nearly. Um, and so I want to minimize my direct costs to keep jobs at a higher gross profit by hiring more people and buying more gear. So I never have to sub rent and I never have to hire a freelancer. Well, that's great on a per job basis. But when you look at all of your jobs together, it's actually quite insane because you, do, you are not busy 12 months out of the year. Having said that, jobs before pandemic, we've only evaluated the job on a job cost basis and job costing in a service business like a live event rental production job doesn't work. Trust me. I spend, my career has been spent fixing companies who believe that job cost matters. It doesn't. Okay? All that matters is the contribution of the job in terms of gross profit, real gross profit, that can be used to pay overhead. Okay, overhead is not a burden, overhead is an obligation. So we need to change the way that we think about this. And here's some of the, this is the fundamental flaw that we have here. So the image on your left is, is an Ouroboros. It's the snake eating it, itself, right? So our focus on job costs devalues other profitable work. And here's how it works. You look at, you have three jobs, they're all identical. The first job, 
I have all the resources. There's no sub rental. I don't need to hire outside people. It's extremely profitable. The second job comes in later. Ooh, we have to sub rent something. Ugh, we got to hire a freelancer. The third job, we have to cross rent three things. We have to hire two freelancers. It looks really unprofitable. And the fact of the matter is all three jobs are identically profitable. And turning down that third job is throwing away money. But we do it all the time. And that's the problem with the job costing mindset that we're in. We have to change. So what you end up with is companies are chasing revenue to make up shortfalls in cash flow. Because when you turn down good cash flow, you don't have enough cash. If you feel you're busy, you turn down work that would help you make money, which means that when you're not busy, you need that work even more. And what do you do? You sell it on price, which reduces your margins, which makes the problem worse. This is what we do. This is job cost thinking. I love this cartoon. It's the perfect metaphor for what we do. You got the sales guys on the right saying, hey, I got my job in the system first. We're doing great. Our jobs are super profitable. And the salesmen who brought jobs in at the end of the thing are sitting there trying to figure out how they can cut costs to make the job profitable enough so the boss will let them sell it. When in fact, they're all in the same boat and they're all going down. So I have watched in my 35 years in the industry, I've watched uh, gross profit, EBITDA, net profit on our industry just slide down a very slippery slope to the point where we're bouncing along the bottom and have been for the past seven or eight, nine years. So now what do we need to change about this? Because we have a chance at a do-over and here we are. How can you do business differently if this has been your traditional model? So what needs to change? The first thing that needs to change in our mindset is that we need to quit thinking that we have a retail price for something. All you know are what your costs are. And if you will calculate all of your jobs from cost and then add margin to it, okay, you will make money. That margin is the equivalent, is the, the, the combination of an adjustment for risk, because what we do is risky, and then the value of your brand or your value proposition that you add to the elements that make it all work. So you're taking people and equipment and you're adding value to it through your intellect, your brand, um, your expertise, your thought leadership, and then you're adjusting for the risks that's inherent in the type of work that you do. And that's what margin actually is. But it all starts from cost. We, our cost, it doesn't matter what our revenue is, the cost won't change. Okay. In the process of job cost analysis, and JCA is what I call how we look at the contribution of an individual job before we sell it. Should we do this job? Will this job make us money? It has less to do with how busy we're going to be during that period and everything to do about the inherent profitability of the job. You know, remember the three jobs I described of the guys in the boat? All those jobs are the same. We have to evaluate them equally. So we're, what we want to see is what will this job contribute in terms of contribution margin, which is not the same as gross profit. Now this is where it gets kind of dicey because we can't use traditional accounting to do job cost analysis. We have to do managerial accounting, which is a completely different discipline. Um, so contribution to margin is the amount of free cash generated by this order, okay? We can't apply any artificial burdens or costs to it. We only apply the true costs that we have. So the value of any order is determined by its risk to cash ratio. The higher the risk, the more cash it better give me, okay? Cash flow is everything right now for your business, okay? Risk is there for everything. If somebody came to you and says, I have a $100,000 order, you're going, yay! It's gonna yield $10,000 in free cash because there's $90,000 in hard cash. They go, oh, so I'm just gonna trade money but I get $10,000, okay. That value of that $10,000 is weighed against the risk inherent in it. If you have risk in the job, in other words, you might not get paid if it doesn't go well, that's too much risk to take for 10%. If you have zero risk, 
No, not a paid in advance guaranteed contribution margin. All you got to do is place these orders and do these things. Then $10,000 is low risk. You would take it all day long. Okay. We are somewhere in between. And by the way, we need bigger margins than that. So dynamic pricing. What is some, what something is worth to you will change throughout the course of the year. It may not change for all your customers, all right, but it will change for you and that affects how you sell. So you want to balance the, your supply and your need for contribution margin. Okay. And we'll talk more about dynamic pricing in a little bit. And pricing of services and hardware need to trade places. And I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Most of you need to dramatically raise your labor prices and do a corresponding cut in your rental rates. I alluded to it a few minutes ago when you're talking about progress billing and getting money up front from jobs that are non-refundable. Remember, the rental equipment has no value until it's actually used or applied. So if you want to recover the value of your services, that needs to come first. You need to pay for that before you pay for equipment. So your risk, your biggest risk is always going to be in people. Um, it may be people who are subcontractors, maybe people who are employees, or just the fact that our customers might be flaky. People are risky or, or incredibly unpredictable. Um, so risk in labor, there is so much risk in labor that we need to increase our margins there. And we need to use the inventory equipment pricing to close the needed business. So what that means in dynamic pricing, okay, I don't change what labor costs because the cost is real. I don't change my margins on labor because my risk is real, but I can dramatically change my margins on my inventory equipment, my asset equipment, because I have very little risk there and I can afford the margin change there. That's where, that's why we only discount equipment, right? We're just not discounting it enough, right? So I'm gonna grab a couple more questions here if we have any. Oh, yep, I see a few. Uh, yeah, how do you enforce spec work versus getting paid for the, for the work? Typically this is pre-contract. You're not gonna like the answer. Don't do spec work. Turn it down. Just say we don't do that. Okay. You you want me to you want me to use my my knowledge and experience and resources to give you something of extraordinary value, on the outside chance that I might be one of the ten companies that gets picked. You know that's extremely risky. Ultimately, the decision is up to you. But I would position myself out of that market and look for a better class of customers. Okay. In the new normal. I don't know why people would do that for people. They're not gonna have the team, they're not gonna have the resources. It's gonna be a lot more difficult for that customer to demand that, that much work on something where there is no guaranteed income. Okay, change your business model, change your mindset. Okay? This is something you need to be in control of, not the customer. Find a better customer. Sorry, I get passionate about this. I hate people doing work for free um, because they fail to do the marketing and business development properly. Um, you let people call the shots and take advantage of you, you're going to get taken advantage of. Um, speaking of pricing, what about what the market will bear philosophy? Pricing is what the other guy has been charged. The pricing is what the other guy has been charging and what the client client is used to paying. What do you say about that? Okay. One, quit matching the way that you do pricing to the way your competitors do pricing. Part of what I'm saying is, it's in the new normal, quit doing an itemized rental price list with a labor addendum. Just stop it, okay? Quit telling the customer how you got to your numbers. Tell them what you're going to do for them and here's the fee. And if they say, well, so-and-so will do it for less. I don't, yes, they probably will. That's your answer. Yeah, I suspect they will. Here's what I'm doing for you. Here are the outcomes, here are the benefits. Here's why you should work with a company like us. I have no control over brand X, Y, or Z, and how they throw pricing around. Here's what I do for you, and here's why it benefits you. You're not gonna win every job on those terms, because sometimes people are gonna to choose to shop on price. That's business. If you cannot afford to lose the job in front of you, it's because you don't have a big enough sales pipeline, and you need this money. In which case, you'd better price dynamically and eliminate any doubt about who is the price leader 
and value later in the conversation. But you can't run a business that way for very long. Uh, for creative services, do you suggest a letter of intent to do business outlining the scope of work and defining chargeable elements? Yeah, that's a very, very good approach to say if somebody says, hey, I need you to do some spec work and say, well, here's what I need you to do. I need you to sign a letter of intent and it says, here are the fees that I'm going to charge you if you do not hire us. Okay. Will you get paid? Yeah, sometimes, um, but not always. But it's better than saying, oh, yes, yeah, so of course, you deserve to have this work done for you for free. Uh, all right, here's an odd question. Uh, how do you feel about charging overtime or double time? Sure, I mean, so I'm not a big fan of double time, but I'm a staffing guy. I understand where it comes from. If we're in double time, then we've done something horribly wrong with the job. Uh, something is wildly out of control, and that's usually why double time exists. It's a way of deterring customers from making dangerous decisions. Uh, but no employee working double time is doing their best work. So, yes, we need to charge labor appropriate and for incidental labor, you know, hourly labor, um, what, no matter what they're doing. I don't care if they're a broadcast engineer or they're, they're pushing road boxes. Um, you need to charge an appropriate overtime for that. And fortunately, you know, we've got labor laws in the U.S. that says here's our standard. Um, you can do a 10 hour day, you can do an eight hour day, you can do a 40 hour, hour a week, doesn't matter what it is, but of course we need to charge overtime. Um, all right. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Long questions are hard, so I'm gonna skip that one. How do you know what the actual cost of your sub rentals are when all the wholesale vendors can be all over the place? Yeah, they are, <laughs> they're all over the place because they don't have a price either because they're pricing dynamically. Um, I think we're going to see an awful lot more of that. So your market rate, your market cost is really based on the wholesale cost, which is going to be pretty dynamic for a while. Um, there's going to be a lot of volatility there. There is no substitute for business acumen and entrepreneurship in determining what is your response to that. You've got to figure out how you're going to take that information, and apply it to your situation, and how much volatility, what are you going to use for the cost of your equipment? And if the wholesale market is all over the place and it's not really wholesale because they might be selling to end clients, um, then what they've done is they just said the entire market rate is depressed, in which case you better focus on your people. That's where you're going to make more of your money. So uh, it's a much longer question than I can answer here in a webinar about how you determine what your internal cost is for your owned equipment, uh, but it is definitely the right question. Um, let's see. Can you please explain the difference between contribution margin and gross profit again? I'm gonna talk more about that. Matter of fact, I'm gonna move on and we'll see if we can't answer some of these questions. All right. Um, Let's think about where value is created for a moment. In our, in our world, in the production rental world, whether we're doing full service events or dry hire rentals, we have uh, transactions that are simple to complex. We have planned to last minute. A planned simple order is probably gonna be the lowest margin because it's the lowest risk. And the value that you create is going to be in the process or the customer experience that you provide. So if you're doing box rentals, um, say you're a wholesale rental company, your value is in having a seamless, painless process. And the more seamless and painless it is, you know, the, and the deeper your inventory, so your answer is always yes, the more valuable you are to your customers. Um, as jobs become more complex, and even a rental, if you need, you know, 150 drops of, of in-ear monitor in the same venue at the same time, that's very complex, okay? Um, that's probably a planned event, and the value is going to be in the experts that you hire to help you make the right equipment selection, frequency coordination, prep, and all that kind of stuff. So your value now becomes in your expertise. If it's... Um, simple and last minute, then it's really just about having capacity. Do you have it? Yes, great, order's yours. Okay. 
many of us want to live in a space where the value is in our outcomes. Um, sometimes those jobs are complex and sometimes they're last minute. The more complex and the more last minute, the more valuable the job is, the higher margin you should be making, the, more, the, the larger contribution you should be making to your organization relative to the value of the job. But if you're doing five complex last minute jobs at the same time, the individual contribution margins are going to shrink because so many resources are being shared but the overall contribution is gonna be huge because it's five times instead of just doing one or two. So I can have a higher gross profit on a job if I don't take a second job. I take the second job, the gross profit of both jobs shrinks, okay? But the contribution of those jobs together is bigger than one job by itself. Right? Um, so think in terms of what are you providing and you have different lines of business, you have different types of customers that come for you for different reasons. Now, with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about some pricing. Now, um, this is sponsored by Avixa, which is a vertical trade association, and um, in deference to Avixa, and just the fact that I think any discussion about a specific pricing um, is unfair and unwise and can be non-competitive. I'm giving you examples here. I'm not suggesting that this is what your price should be. Um, pricing needs to be competitive, it needs to be fair, but how you choose to do it, um, in other words, we can't be price fixing in these conversations. So having said all that, so seven, I paid attention, I was on the board for seven years at Avixa, I paid attention. All right, in general, labor is risky. So your labor price should be two to four times what your cost is in general. And let me give you an example because there are so many variations on this, but you need to see how it's applied. Let's take a basic laborer. Let's assume that you're paying them a, a, re, a living minimum wage of $15 an hour, plus their W-2 and their benefits, and so, that's, so your cost is $21.50 an hour. If you were to outsource that same position to a third-party labor company, staffing company, you might pay $31 an hour for somebody to do the exact same thing. Now, what should my price to the customer be? Well, based on these numbers, it should be a minimum of two times cost, which is $62. But in a major market, the value of skilled labor goes up, it might be $93, three times cost. And if I'm gonna do a short call, a service call, you know, a quick setup, I can charge four times that, which would be 114 an hour, or maybe $238 or $28 for, a person to set up a small order to our minimum. Okay? This is how you need to look at this. The, the numbers you should be charging are much, much higher than what most of you are charging right now. Now, in that scenario, with that knowledge of your costs, you would not employ full-time unless you had a full-time demand. I don't wanna pay somebody 40 hours a week okay, and charge $62 an hour for that when I've only got 20 hours of chargeable work for them. And I've heard all the excuses about, well, they can do other stuff in the warehouse. That's not actually how it works, folks. They're either doing busy work or they're doing work that you should have hired seasonally for. So you have to do some serious math before you can justify people who work full time, but you don't have full time work for them. All right. um, so until you have steady demand, all laborers should be part time or outsourced. So if you're a startup company, you just started out, you bought your first 10 pieces of equipment and you're working out of a storage shed, you don't need a staff. You get a gig, you need some help, you hire somebody. Right? Think like a startup and you will make better business decisions. Now, moving into the specialist world where I have a lot of experience uh, pricing and supplying these folks, you know, your billable rate's gonna be mm, one and a half to three times replacement cost. So the easier to source something, the lower the factor. Um, we have, and this is, this is no disrespect to anybody, but in Dallas, you cannot swing a dead cat without hitting somebody who's a camera operator, right? I can't charge three times what camera operators cost in the Dallas market because they are plentiful. Now the good ones are worth every penny. Um, so the easier to source something, the lower the factor that you can apply to the replacement cost and get it. Um, if you have the only E2 operator in your region, and if you need to get a freelancer from another market 
and you have to fly them in and pay their expenses in order to have another one, that's the value of your E2 operator in your market. You get to charge a lot more. And if you're in, you know, rural Iowa, and your E2 operator is going to come from Chicago, it's your E2 operator is worth Chicago rates, even though you might have a local person who's qualified. So you can charge more for that person. So demand, risk, okay, affects what you should be charging. <sighs> Rental inventories. You know, you know, for years, and, and this has been nap, consultant napkin advice, you know, you take your wholesale rate, you multiply it by two, and then you discount it, and that's what you sell to the customer. So your retail price is generally one and a half or two times wholesale. This is still basically true, uh, except that wholesale is going to be in flux. Um, I, I suspect wholesale prices are going to drop um, until demand is back up. Um, and whatever you're doing with your real, if you continue to sell from a retail price instead of selling from cost, um, you're going to have to discount much more deeply in the new normal. So you're going to have to leave a double or triple the discounts to your customer in order to remain competitive. So if your average discount off of retail was 15%, then all of a sudden you're looking at starting at 30%, you may have to go 40 or 50. You know, it's going to vary depending on where you've been um, and what kind of market segment that you're in. You know, your discounts are really based on your supply. Um, your busy and slow times may not match your competitors. So somebody's going to ask me a question about, well, I quoted this and this is what it's worth to me, but my competitors are, you know, undercutting me all the time. Yeah, because their supply demand curve is different than yours. So you need to decide which is more valuable, getting the job or getting the customer, in which case you may have to price to win the customer, which is a different strategy than pricing to win the job. Okay. Um, so again, you have to think like an entrepreneur to make all of this work. If you're pricing from cost, which is where I'm advocating most of you go, then your cost is, of course, replacement cost. And if you need one more than you have, what does that cost you to get it? That's your replacement cost. There are some things, and it was fun back in the, the go-go 90s where, you know, it was easier to buy new inventory than it was to sub-rent. Uh, so I, 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 I had a gig one time, it had 70 breakout rooms and we weren't a breakout company, but I put together the rental price. We won the job and my rental price was based on, they had two jobs that year and my rental price was based on buying all the equipment and paying 75% of it in the first job, getting another 75% and getting one and a half time my purchase price over two gigs. So I went out and we bought 72 tripod screens, 72 overhead projectors, 72 you know, whatever for each of these breakout rooms, and we owned it. Um, and I got a great return on that until the second gig canceled. Um, and we didn't have a cancellation clause that allowed us to recover anything from that. But I paid for 75% of that gear. It worked for years and years later. We still made money on it. So you need to look at what your replacement cost is. Sometimes your replacement cost is actually buying it, and what do you need to do to cover your investment on the equipment. Once you have your costs, you add margin or you add markup and there is a difference. Remember, if you mark something up 25%, it's only gonna give you 20% profit, right? This is math. So learn the difference between margin and markup. Markup is dangerous because we go, oh man, we marked that up 50%. Yeah, well marking up 50% only got you 33% gross profit. So marking it up 33% doesn't give you 33% gross profit. It gives you 25% gross profit. So learn the language of math and do the math that's appropriate for the discussion that you're having. Um, and your margin is going to fluctuate depending on your supply. So you're going to have busy and slow times. Again, they don't match your competitors. Um, now, moving on to, you know, we did rental. Let's talk about, you know, doing a show, doing a service order. Uh, you have the costs from all the individual pieces of the project when you're putting your numbers together. And what you're looking at is the blended margin. So the mistake you can't make is saying, all of our jobs have to give us 33% gross profit or we don't do it. Because that's an irrelevant number when you're comparing jobs. Remember what I said about job cost is, is silly. 
Okay? What we want to look at is the blended margin of the job and see whether the job makes sense. Okay? So in the example here, I have an equipment where my cost is $1,000 based on whatever metric I use in my system to determine cost of equipment. And I'm going to add 25% margin on it, which is the same as a 33% markup. Okay? My labor, my cost is 500. I'm going to charge 1,000. Uh, my delivery costs are 250. I'm going to charge 500. So I've got a $2,800 job with $1,700 of cost, gross profit of $1,100. I'm going to make 38%. Okay? So my blended margin is 38%, even though my margin on equipment is only 25, my margin on equipment is 50, my margin on delivery is 50. The blended margin is what you're tar targeting here. I can't set a target for blended margin though, because if I change the mix of equipment labor, the blended margin is gonna come out differently. So what I'm looking for is making sure that the margin for each product class is preserved. Look at the integrity of your individual pricing in order to do this. Uh, bundled services. Um, if you're doing professional services that need equipment to support, um, Use your highest labor rate and your lowest equipment rate. And I'll give you some examples. Web streaming, a video shoot, you know, a, a professional camera operator with an EFP package that can go out and do a location shoot is high dollar for the, the camera operator and low dollar for the equipment. The equipment's going to be a great value. Except we're going to change the wording. We're going to change the order of our words, and it's going to dramatically increase the value. This may be the most important thing you get out of today's webinar. It's not a camera and an operator. It's a videographer and a camera and lighting package. Put the high value item first, and that's going to be the human factor. It's not a sound system and an operator. It's an audio engineer and a voice reinforcement system. Put the person first. You can now charge more. Just change the language of how you present the value of what you do and emphasize people. It will go a long way to changing your rental mindset where you think rental is what's making you your money when in fact it's rental that's driving your margins down because it's commoditized. People are not commoditized. We do sometimes commoditize people, but we do it by emphasizing rental, which is almost always a commodity. Now, ongoing a new business, um, you've got stuff in your pipeline and we can't apply everything I just talked about to it. So you've got existing orders for May and June, some of which might actually happen, yay, I hope they do. Leave them as they is, but be really flexible if they add anything. So if they add something to the order, don't go back to your February pricing, okay? You might start looking at your post-pandemic pricing as you, um, as you add to that. Give them some value back. Also be willing to drop your price if they ask. Give them a little bit of concession in this. It's better to keep the job and eat a few points um, than to risk them shopping it around because they know right now anybody else would do the job for a lot less. If you get new orders for May and June, you can use your before pandemic pricing if it's applicable to that job, but you're going to have to discount more aggressively. So you may not be ready to change the rates that your customers are used to seeing, but you can discount a little bit more aggressively and, and be, have, be realistic about the situation that we all know everyone is in. Uh, if you're doing streaming studio or other non-legacy services, if you've set up a, a, an origination site in your warehouse, whatever it might be, then use the new pricing guidelines. This is a service. This is where you're, you know, what I was talking about, a bundled service. I want to put, a, a, a crew of experts to do streaming and the gear that goes with it to help them do their job. When you're doing bundled services, you're selling the people, the gear is an accoutrement. Remember the plumber story from last week? You're hiring a plumber who has a $10 tool. You're not renting a $10 tool with a plumber to operate it, right? And dynamic pricing, look, in the slowest of slow times, when it's crickets out there, if you own the equipment, it's free. Calculate the cost of prepping the equipment, calculate the cost of expendables, calculate the labor for technicians to serve the equipment and do the work, make the deliveries. That's where the value is. 
Right? If you got to get your price down, you may as well give it, you know, after 9-11, you know, one of the major, you know, pissed a lot of people off, but they were absolutely right for doing this. One of the major players in our industry sent a note out to all of their clients and said, we will do any job you want us to do for the cost of labor only. Our entire warehouse is yours. They were right. They completely understood the situation, the dynamic pricing. They had people to pay, to keep employed, to keep engaged. They had marketplace that they needed to be involved in. And they wanted to make sure that those customers were talking to them because why wouldn't they? Now, did they make money on those jobs? Yeah, they probably did. And they certainly made more money than not doing the job. So were they right? Yeah, I think they were. Um, so uh, when you're busiest is when you're at your highest risk. So the busier you are, the riskier the jobs become, right? So that's when you want your margins up higher. You're going to discount less or you're going to add more margin to the job. Um, a period isn't peak until there's full demand for you. So you can't just say, and certainly not coming out of our current situation, you can't say, well, we're always busy in February, so we better price high. Right now, we have no idea if you're going to be busy in February. <laughs> that first job that you sell in February, of next year, it's going to be lower price than what you're used to. The second job, if it overlaps, you can raise the price a little bit more. Third job, if it overlaps, you can raise, raise the price a little bit more. The fourth job, if it happens after those other three jobs, your price can go back down. Okay. A period isn't peak until there is full demand for you. And if you have every date full and people want to do one more job and you can minimize your risk and create contribution margin, after you all your sub rentals and outsourcing and subcontracting, take it. That extra profit will make the difference between a good year and a bad year. That's what being in business is all about. That's the model that works for our industry. Be as infinitely scalable as you can possibly imagine. Right? It's more about having the process and having the partners that you can work with to deliver a good job. All right, I want to get to questions here in just a second. I know we're running long, but I told you I had a ton of content. Um, you've got a pricing do-over. Let me summarize what you need to do. Replace your retail pricing with costs. Retail pricing is fiction. It, it never really existed anyway. All of your prices were made up. Your discounts were made up. Your weekly multipliers were made up. None of that really matters. Let it go. It's in the past. Um, it's a legacy thing that we do that does, is not worthy of you in the new normal. Um, Figure out what your costs are, and that's where you work from. If your costs are lower than your competitors, you have a price advantage. Uh, replace discount with margin added. If you're working in any kind of rental management software, um, imagine all the pricing on your line items, on your product codes, was your cost instead of the retail price. And imagine the discount on that line is margin, and you just put a negative in front of it, and it adds margin to it. Okay? Think... Think creatively. You'd be amazed at what you can do with the resources you already have. Um, I know I'm just, I just sent a bunch of software programmers over the edge right there, but trust me, you can do that. Um, adjust margins for busy and slow, risky versus easy, and then don't compare margins between jobs unless they are identical. That's the only time it matters. If they're an identical job in an identical time period, then if I sold one first, maybe its margin is going to be higher or lower than the one I sold second. But if I'm going to sell it second, that margin should be higher than the one I sold first because your risk is increasing. Okay? If you can serve them both equally and spread the risk among both of them, there's no reason you can't price them exactly the same if it will help you win more business. All right, I'm going to pause for some questions uh, here. Um, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about next week. I've got a few announcements and I'll answer more questions. I want to be sensitive to your time, but we have a lot to go over. Uh, A lot of preserves are doing quotes using rental management software. Have you seen a good use of this type of software to generate a quote that doesn't focus on the gear? Okay, here's how, here, let me give you the basic thing. The rental management software is awesome. Use it. You've got product codes in there and you've got pricing. You've got either retail or cost, whatever your model is. Use that to build your estimate. In my humble opinion, you should never let your customer see anything that was generated by that unless it goes into a word template where you generate a scope of work and says, here's what, here's what we're doing for you. And here's the benefits you're going to receive. And here's the price. 
So we need that rental management software often to put the order together to see what the intrinsic value of it is, but that's not what we should be selling from. So that's the shortest answer I can give to that question because I, I have literally done eight hour seminars on that exact topic. Okay. You know, how do we determine the cost of a job when we are quoting it? Um, well, I mean, how do you do it now? Nothing, <laughs> nothing that really changed. So the cost of a job, you have to predetermine what all of your costs are in the system I'm describing. If you don't know what the cost for something is, you'll have to do the research, just like you do now. You know, you've got to sub rent something, you make a few phone calls, you get an estimate, you figure out what your cost is, you mark it up, use margin, you put some margin on it, and you have a go-to price. For all the things that you normally do, you need to go back and figure out what those costs are. It, it sounds hugely tedious. It's not as bad as it sounds. I've done it with dozens of companies. Um, you, a lot of it can be changed in a batch. Um, so it's not as bad as you think. You'll end up researching or, or doing special handling. If you have you know, 5,000 product codes, you'll do special handling on 500 of them. Um, the rest you're going to just batch the cost number into it. You'd be surprised how much data you have for doing this. Um, it just takes a little bit of time. Um, would you offer credit to a portion of an installation design fee for a client if they cho choose you to go forward? What if the client is not looking for alternate companies? What would I offer then? All right, so if you're doing design build and the client won't commit to the build until the design, then I would charge them a design fee and then I would give them credit for a part of the design fee if they, if they go forward with you for the build. I mean, it's pretty simple. Or, but the value to the customer is they can take the design and they can now go shop it. The value to you is you can design something nobody else can quote as well as you can and price as favorably as you can. Uh, so you don't give the client so much information that they can shop it, but you give them enough information where they feel that they own the design and they can go do what they need to do with it. Um, if the client is not looking for ultimate, if it is a true design build job and they're committing to the entire design build project, then you're going to do pay as you go or progress billing and you're going to tell them what the elements are. And you can say if the client has a not to exceed budget of, you know, $500,000 for the build, um, then we say, okay, in the design phase, we're going to design to the budget and here's what the design costs. Right. And then you work backwards from there. So, in a $500,000 spend, they may only have $400,000 that actually goes to product or 300 or whatever it may be, but you're working backwards from that number. And that's definitely a pay as you go model in design build environment. All right, um, we'll have more questions. Keep putting those questions in there, but uh, we've been at this for an hour. So I wanna give, uh, talk about next week. Next week, we're gonna move into sales. And we're gonna talk about what you should be doing in marketing, business development and sales pre-recovery. So this is what we're doing during our interim, during our airplane mode. Um, and when do we start moving it to the next level? So a few weeks after that, I'll probably talk about what happens uh, later on down the road. Um, and we'll see, uh, we'll see how far we get with the time that we have available. Now, a couple of announcements, and then I'll answer some more questions. Thank you guys for, you guys, uh, I'm not looking at the chat, but there's been 115 chats in there. So you guys are having a good time. Um, I'm hoping you're making some connections and following up. Um, I just launched today. Um, you're the first ones to hear about it. Um, is a, a I'm, I'm, I'm providing group coaching to business owners. What I'm recognizing from all the conversations with you is that you need to talk to some other people and you need to be working on your business and you need to be doing it with more than one person advising you because it's less expensive. So how can I give you the support that you need, part of which I am, and make you smarter? Well, we need more people in the conversation. So I want to get groups of 10, 12, maximum 15 people together to do group coaching. Uh, we'll do bi-weekly calls. We will um, push a program forward because we're trying to get you ready for your reboot, your relaunch which could be you know, late summer or early fall, get you ready for the relaunch, um, your new business model with, a, with really smart people helping you figure out how to make it better and you're helping them make theirs better. 
My program includes one-on-one -on -one time with me. So you get monthly coaching with me. For those of you who want more access to my time, here's a way that you can do this. Scan the QR code, go check out the webpage, take a look at it. If it's right for you, shoot me an email. Um, when I find, when I get a group together, we'll start a group. I'd like to start one in two weeks. So I'm ready to go if you're ready to go. And if you know some people, some peers, some buddies that you work with that you think they should be involved too, you can get together and come to me as a group and we'll get you on as a group and let you be in the same peer group together if that's what you want. So um, I think it's gonna be a great value. Um, it's certainly priced as a really good value because right now we need this more than we need to spend money. So let's find a way to do that. Um, I'm still doing the free calls. If you haven't taken advantage of it, do schedule that. I'd be happy to visit with you and help move you on down the road a little bit. Um, don't forget about Avixa's Business Survival Exchange. You can register for that by going to avixa.org slash business dash survival and register. They do it Zoom, so they do a Zoom presentation. They do breakouts. Everything's moderated. Um, getting some good feedback from that. Please participate, and you can talk more about this stuff, and you can talk about how crazy Tom is uh, because I won't be on the call because I don't want to get in the way of your conversation. So please take these ideas and move them forward and improve upon them. Uh, the webinar recording, of course, will be posted here at this link. Um, we're just adding a webinar each week to it, and whatever links or resources that we share, we'll put in there as well. And you can go back and look at the ones from the, you know, the past four weeks. And of course, this is all because we know that the show will go on. Um, and when it does go on, we're the ones that are going to be there because you are paying attention right now and doing the things for your business that will make you viable going forward in the PPE, post-pandemic era. So uh, I'm going to answer some more questions for as long as you can hang on. But you've had all the big announcements if you're, if you're short on time. And you can catch the rest of the questions in the recording. But for those of you who uh, just like to hang out, well, ask some questions. All right. Um, I have a possible in-house that is coming to me. Okay, I have, so it sounds like I've got a hotel that's coming to me because the last company moved out of the area, which is gonna happen a lot. Uh, she's giving me the price list last company used for events and she's worried about big fast changes affecting customers who already signed contracts for the summer and fall. We try and maintain similar pricing to the old company. I'm not a fan of how they've arranged it based on items rather than labor and packages. All right, so if you have the opportunity to move into, to be a preferred provider in a venue and they have existing contracts from the old supplier, um, do whatever you can to honor that pricing because your client in a venue is the venue. Okay? It will best serve the venue if you preserve the pricing that's been put in front of their customers. Now, you may have limitations on the scope that you want to enforce. Um, you may have some ways to do it differently. You can certainly discuss with the customer how you want to do it. That might be different, but try and honor their pricing is the best way going forward. You want to preserve the relationship with the hotel and taking care of their customers is absolutely the best way of doing that. Thanks, that's a, that's a great question. Um, let's see. <laughs> All right, so we used to get three days a week for rental gear. The new normal seems to be one day a week and the client still wants a heavy discount. At some point you reach a diminishing term very quickly. Yes, you absolutely do. Um, you know, back when I started, it was a four day week. Um, it was four days on the West Coast. It was three, three and a half days on the East Coast. We did three days in the middle of the country. It's all over the place. Uh, lighting was a two-day week. Then it became a one-day week. LED was like, oh, we just make up pricing, whatever we can get for it. But a day is always the same as a week. Um, yeah, it's all over the map. Um, so make sure that you know what your costs are and present it to a customer in a way where they're negotiating something that you have control over the value of which will be the rental equipment and not the labor. So yeah, it is all over the map. Yeah, so uh, could you clarify the difference between margin and markup with an example that shows how they come out differently? Yes, if I take uh, $100 and I mark it up 20%, it's $120. My cost is 100 and I sell it for 120, I have $20 left over. 20 into 120 is 16.67%. So my margin is 16.67%, even though my markup was 20%, okay? Let me do it differently. I take $100 and, I'm, and I add 
20% margin to it. Okay. It's going to be $133, right? So if you just Google margin versus markup, you'll find 100 examples of this. You want to take margin. So a 50% margin on $100 would be $200. Okay. I sell it for $200. It costs me $100. I make 100% $100 gross profit, which means my margin was 100%. Or 50, I'm sorry, 50%. So 20% markup is 16.67% profit. 25% markup is 20% profit. 30% markup is 23% uh, gross profit. Okay. If I add 25% margin, I will get 25% margin or 25% gross profit. If I add 33% margin, I will get 33% gross profit. That's the difference. Okay. How do you get salespeople to understand this? I don't know. That's not a fair question. Um, sales management. Um, I, I, and honestly, I, I mean, I was a sales manager for a year, but I had great salespeople when I was doing this. It is a little bit like herding kittens. Um, what salespeople have to do is they have to use the pricing tools and parameters that you provide them. So whether they understand it or not doesn't matter as long as they use the tools. And oh, by the way, you are reviewing every quote before it gets sent to a customer, right? Because if you're not, you're completely missing the point about salespeople. Okay? I, I managed a team of eight, 12 salespeople. Um, they probably generated 40 or $50 million a year in quotes. I personally reviewed 80% of them. And in one, the ones I didn't review, somebody else reviewed. Don't tell me you don't have time to review quotes. It's your business. And if you haven't made time for this, you're focusing on the wrong thing. So if you wanna keep salespeople in line, um, sales management, hello. Sales management is an operational job, by the way, not a sales job. Um, the best sales managers I've ever worked with were operations people. I'm an ops guy. I manage salespeople. I may not have been the best sales coach, but by God, we knew what we were doing when it comes to getting clean quotes out there that made sense and had profit built into them. All right, let's see. What is full demand if we don't have full-time employees and we already sub rent regularly? You get it. You're infinitely scalable. Right? If you can subrent regularly and you have a labor pool, probably the biggest limitation you're going to have in your demand curve is people. When you run out of freelancers and the more last minute it gets, the harder it is to fill crews, that's your limitation. Okay? So that's what your demand is. For most of us, we have way more equipment than we're going to have customers for. Okay? Not great if, for the subrental trade, but we always won't have the right thing. Okay? but we'll have a lot of it. We're going to run out of people. We've always run out of people, but in the past, because we so, made so little money on them, if we ran out of people, we quit selling. I want you to price in such a way that when you run out of people, you work twice as hard to find more people. And you put a ton of energy in developing a very large, reliable talent pool, and you book them as far advanced as you possibly can. That is the key to being a scalable business having a great bench of people. All right. All right, what about sub rentals and pricing to other companies? Those prices previously were based on a discounted list price. Okay. In your B2B sub rental business, we're gonna rent back and forth to each other. Um, there's a certain amount of transparency, which was traditional um, back in the day, back when I was a person taking sub rental orders and. CEOs, people who are now CEOs of large corporations were the people calling the order in or taking my order. We were pretty transparent about what we were charging and what we were getting and try and accommodate each other's profit margin. Uh, sometimes we had mutual agreements based on retail pricing. Um, in B2B, it really comes down to what are they willing to pay? Okay. Their job is to try and pay less and your job is to say no unless it's worth your while. So that's what you're working out. You know, if it, if it costs you four man hours to prep something and you're only going to get $400 for the order, 
don't do it because you're upside down. It costs you $100 to prep something, right? So you need to understand what your costs are and what it takes to put it out there. And I'd say in B2B, we're going to offer each other prices and you can take it or you can leave it. Um, but I, an honest conversation about what the costs are and what seems fair is always appropriate in B2B situations. Uh, I got a comment here about please emphasizing the owners not to dip into retirement to make uh, to make it to the other end. And yeah, I'll, I definitely agree with that. If you've got retirement 401k money set aside, uh, keep it there. Do everything you can. Don't even borrow against it. Don't take a loan out against your 401k if you can possibly avoid it. Um, redo your cash flow numbers. Redo your overhead numbers to make the cash that you have go as far as you can. Uh, drawing down... And while I say borrowing money is preferable, if you can get a bank loan or a government loan or a subsidized loan to keep your business going, that's far preferable than taking money out of your uh, your retirement. Um, that's why you got into business. If you're a business owner, whether you understand it or not, you're probably thinking about it really hard right now. You need to have an exit strategy. Uh, you need to know where you're going. And putting money into a company that is going to be worth less uh, your, your retirement money is much better off being exactly where it is. Um, I'm not a financial planner. I don't, I don't even play one on television. Um, I think that's just common sense, but do listen to the people who have more letters after their name than I do. Um, is the reboot coaching the same one that Beth Knight sent invites to for a week or so ago? No, it's not. So Beth Knight is with Avixa. Um, and she is promoting the uh, VIXA Business Survival Exchange, which is absolutely free. Um, that's a, just a free benefit to the industry. And that happens every week. And it talks about the webinar that we just did. Uh, the reboot coaching that I am doing is for owners working directly with me and a peer group of owners. And we will do it as a four-month program. We will extend it, of course, to anybody who wants to extend after that. But I'm trying to get you back to the point where you're making revenue again and have your business set up to work in the new model, whatever your reboot model is. All right. So um, I'm, I, this is what I do for a living. I help companies reorganize, replan, and re-strategize. So I want to be your collaboration partner on this. But I want to make it as accessible to as many people as possible, which means let's get us into a group. Let's use our group to be better at doing all of this and keep the costs of uh, redesigning and relaunching your business to an absolute minimum. Thank you for asking for that clarification. And, uh, and, and Beth is awesome, by the way. So if you get an email from Beth tonight, please open it because she's offering you important free stuff. Um, how are we doing on time? I'm going to take one or two more questions here. Um, is the group coaching for a month? No, the group coaching is for four months. So it'll be May through August. So take a look at the website. We've got a nice page there to tell you all about it. And absolutely e email me questions. Um, I don't think we can do anything effectively with a group in a month. But um, if you need some one-on-one -on -one coaching, we can certainly talk about that. Is replacement cost what it costs you to buy or to rent? Yes. Whatever your replacement cost is. Um, if you cannot rent it, then it's the cost to buy it. Um, and then now it's simply an ROI calculation. So it's not the purchase price. It's how often do you think you can rent it? If you can only rent it once a year, then why would you buy it? You need to find another solution. But I have personally charged a client 100% of what it cost me to buy something because they needed it and it couldn't be sourced anywhere else. Um, and they paid it. So sometimes that does happen. Uh, rental equipment cost is the new replacement cost divided by some factor. That is what you're saying, question mark. Why is that different in the past? No, that's not exactly what I'm saying. Um, if you can readily source something, um, um, if you can readily source a moving light for $150 a week, and there's plenty of them out there, okay, then your replacement cost is $150 a week. Um, you can probably sell it because it's lighting equipment and it's readily available. You can't double it, but you can probably do one and a half times. So your price, your go-to-market would be to add, you know, 50% <laughs> markup to it. Um, so they cost you 150, rent it for 225. You'll make money. Everybody's happy. Um, if it is harder to source, obviously 
the number is going to be higher. If it's a hard to source item at 150 a week, I'm probably justified in charging $300 a week. Now, don't forget that you also have to include the cost of getting that to you. If it is not in your marketplace, if it's out of the market, even sending a delivery truck across town costs you money. So let's be realistic about what things actually cost you because you can't just be tamped eating those costs because that's how we get into these really low margin, low profit company situations. Um, yeah, um, comment here about being, yeah, we are surprisingly infinitely scalable. Um, if you're in the business of doing shows, you don't have to own every resource and you can always find more. There's, you know, there are 500 people on this call who could all help you. Um, there are tens of thousands of more companies out there. Um, we have a lot of capacity in our industry, even more capacity. You can be as big as you want and have as little overhead as you want. Um, it's an amazing, amazing business and an amazing time to reform your business. So with that, I'm going to close. Um, be well, be safe, um, fill out your PPP forms, do your cash flow projections, um, take the little victories because they move your cash flow farther out um, to get us closer and closer to the time that we're back doing regular business again. Uh, take care of yourselves, call your family, uh, get caught up on Netflix, but do work on your business every day. Don't let it just sit there because we're slow. We have a lot of valuable work to do between now and whenever show season starts up again. So thanks everybody. Be well. Talk to you next week.